Hello, welcome back again to Archaeology 101. Today I'm going to be doing an overview of the Mesolithic period in what some academics used to describe as the prehistoric Dark Age. Let's begin with some chronology. The British Mesolithic begins around 10,000 BC, right after the end of the Upper Paleolithic period. The Mesolithic will continue until 4000 BC when the Neolithic period begins. During the Paleolithic, Britain went through periods of being a frozen wasteland, either wholly uninhabitable or partially uninhabitable, meaning that it went through periods where there were no humans in Britain at all. However, now, during the Mesolithic period, the climate was beginning to warm and give way to the Holocene. This means that the glaciers were melting and that sea levels were rising. Despite this, at the beginning of the Mesolithic period, Britain was still attached to continental Europe via Doggerland, or as it's known now, submerged under water, the Dogger Bank. Britain would remain attached to the continent until around 6500 BC. I always think the best place to start when trying to gain an insight into a past population is by looking at their burial records first. However, as is keeping in with the theme of the Mesolithic period in Britain, there are very few of them. Only around 20 sites in the UK have ever revealed any Mesolithic human remains. And to give you an example, we found the first human cremation from the Mesolithic period only in 2014. And that was a particularly late date as well, dating to around 5600 BC. If you look to Ireland or the continent, Mesolithic cremations are much more common. But in Britain, we only have one documented example. Prior to 2014, the last Mesolithic human remains to ever be found was in the early 1960s. If we go back to looking at the continent, Mesolithic burials are much more common and are much grander than in the Mesolithic period. A very famous example is Vedbeck in Denmark, which is a Mesolithic cemetery. And if you look on the image to the right, that's the swan burial where the there's a mother buried with her child who's laid on the wing of a swan. And we just don't have anything parallel within Britain. But I will discuss why we don't really have a very good record of the Mesolithic population later on in the video. I'll begin with the most famous example of British Mesolithic burial, and that is Cheddar Man. He was discovered in Goff's Cave in Cheddar in Somerset in 1903. The cave systems of Cheddar Gorge were well done over by the Victorians. They used the cave systems often as sort of amusements. They were an attraction to tourists and Victorians had been mucking around in these caves for a very long time. And it was well known that you could find ancient animal bones, but also human remains. And that's how a lot of Mesolithic burials in Cheddar cave systems were discovered. Unfortunately, Victorians never did this with very much care, and they very rarely left a record. In Cheddar Man's case, he was discovered surprisingly late, so we do have some record of how he was discovered, but it still isn't great. And there is a lot of sort of environmental and background data which has been lost because either the technology wasn't there or the standards of excavation just weren't there to record what happened. So Cheddar Man is actually surprisingly well documented in comparison to other excavation at the time. Later analysis of him discovered that he was around 10,000 years old. So this is a early Mesolithic human. Genetic analysis showed that he had pale eyes, either blue or green. He was lactose intolerant, which fits in with the wider population of the time. And he contains Western hunter-gatherer DNA, or you might see the acronym WHG. 
Western hunter-gatherer DNA stems from around 125,000 years ago from an as of yet undetermined origin, but academics reckon that it stems from either Southeast Europe or the Near East. So this shows an influx of people from the East into the West many thousand years ago. Not too far from Goff's cave is Aveline's Hole. This cave has a very complicated history, so I'm going to do this in as chronological order as I can. It was initially discovered in 1797, supposedly by two boys who were chasing a rabbit. The cave system was then very quickly explored by Victorians, who did an absolutely horrific job of doing any recording of the cave systems, and they effectively just ransacked it for human remains and they just wanted pieces of human bone. Supposedly about 100 individuals were recovered, but given the sparseness of the reports, who actually knows how many were found? Today, we only have about 21 adults left. Even though the cave system was later excavated in the 20th century, there was further damage caused to the collection when the skeletons were put into a repository in Bristol and unfortunately in World War II that was then bombed. Although not too much was lost, some of the records were destroyed, so there is some context lost about how these human remains were found. So the best case example we have from Evelyn's Hole is a double burial where two individuals were placed with what seems to be burnt red deer teeth. However, even later analysis proved to be tricky. It seemed that there were some errors in the carbon dating in the earlier 21st century, when in 2019 there was some further analysis on the collection, which used ancient DNA testing, which actually showed that some of Aveline's hole, the individuals within it, were from the early Neolithic rather than the Mesolithic period, as was always assumed because of the carbon dating. But this shows that there was considerable errors in the carbon dating. We do know that about two of the individuals were genuinely Mesolithic, where they could actually get some DNA from. It was a real issue gaining any DNA from uh, these individuals, and it worked for about 10% of them. And I encourage everyone to go read that paper. It's in the links below. What was a theme, though, that across the skeletal assemblage was that many of them had suffered malnutrition at points in their childhood, which came from the hyperplasia on their teeth. So clearly a hard life, and many of them had arthritis, even though none of the skeletons were particularly old. I'm going to move on now to a quote which sort of demonstrates how badly the Victorians treated Aveline's Hole, and it sort of explains why a lot of the Mesolithic collections are just almost unusable. When I was researching Aveline's Hole, I came across this paper by Rick Schulting from 2005, and in it he includes an extract from the writings of a Reverend John Skinner in 1824, who actually provides a short account of how skeletons were procured from the cavern and how they were treated at the time, which is quite fascinating and also very infuriating. The methods that they use here to get skeletons out makes my blood boil, but they didn't really know or perhaps really care for careful collection of uh, archaeological remains at this time. And I would hope that our methods had improved since 1824. So here's the extract. For several days after the discovery was made, persons came from all parts to visit the place and took away some of the bones with them, till Mr. Wild, the rector of Burrington, had several cartloads of earth thrown over the bones in order to bury them. But as the sheep are continuously entering the cavern, these bones are from time to time uncovered Indeed, we saw several which had been collected at the entrance, some evidently human, others of swine, sheep, and larger animals, either oxen or horses, and one the jaw of a fox. As I wished much to procure a specimen of the incrustation, I desired the man to dig with his pickaxe, 
where he thought he could meet with one, and in the course of a quarter of an hour he brought me the greater part of a cranium entirely embedded in the stalactite. In getting it out he broke it off from the skull, and I have no doubt but the skeleton might be procured from the same place. I wish I had a man to go and dig for me, that would be amazing. But effectively what the Reverend Skinner has done here is he wanted a skeleton that's not loose, but in the original context, as it were, so an undisturbed skeleton. And uh, his man duly gave him part of the cranium with his pickaxe. Oh boy. <laughs> As you can see, there is such a small sample size of human remains which have not been analysed very well. Therefore, we can't really say much about the human population during the Mesolithic period from human remains themselves. So we have to look at what else the Mesolithic people left behind. Mesolithic sites tend to be rather unassuming. They're usually comprised of small scatters of flint flakes, flint tools, and the occasional pit. That's not really much to go on. However, we do have some rare case studies which do really break through how well adapted Mesolithic people were to the British landscape. This case study you've probably heard of before, and that's Star Car, which is in Yorkshire. Star Car is the most famous Mesolithic site in Britain. It's also probably one of the most important archaeological sites in Britain, full stop. Starkar in the Mesolithic was a rich wetland, and it comprised of a lake. It still does, but back then it was also a lake. And this was stuffed full of wild game, such as red deer. And you might know Starkar most of all from the red deer headdresses, or frontlets as they're known. There are about 21 of these in total. What they were actually for, we don't know whether it was uh, just for the sake of having a red deer headdress or whether it had some practical purposes. Back in the 1940s, it was suggested that they might have been used as a way of pretending to be red deer to, as a hunting sort of tool to sort of make yourself invisible almost to other red deer. What the actual truth there is, we don't know. But what is very interesting about Star Car is that it's so old. It starts to have humans exploiting its landscape around 9300 BC, which is only about 700 years after the end of the Upper Paleolithic period. Star Car is most intriguing because we have actual structures here. For example, in 2008, there was a hut structure found there, which is one of the earliest hut structures that we have in all of Britain. And this was found in the dryland area away from the, the wetlands. So people prefer to live in dryland, which makes sense. It was a small hut, maybe about three meters in diameter. And all we have left of it really is a pit and a couple of post holes. And around it, we can find a dense lithic assemblage. This isn't the only structure, however, and prior to the house being found, there was a trackway or platform discovered. And what was really intriguing about this structure is that it's made up of split planks, which amazed the excavators just of how finely split the planks were. They weren't thick, as you might think from people who had arguably not very advanced tools, but they were able to produce quite skilled craftsmanship here, and this trackway dated to around 9000 BC. We can also tell from environmental evidence that this was a managed landscape. So from evidence of burning, we can see that the Mesolithic population were clearing reeds periodically. And indeed, the hunter-gatherers who lived here probably didn't live here all the time. They may have come here during particular periods, whether to follow food sources or shelter from harsh winters, for example. What is more intriguing is that only 5% of Star Car has been excavated, and so there is much more to be gleaned from this site. There is an unfortunate consequence of a modern landscape impacting on Star Car, however, 
back in the 1980s, part of the Lake Flixton area was used as landfill, and that's had a knock on to the water table in the archaeological area, meaning that it's more acidic. So every year, the archaeology is becoming more and more degraded. So hopefully, we'll be able to save some of this in the near future. So keep your eye out for Star Car. It is such a rare occurrence to find any evidence of Mesolithic settlement in Britain. However, they must have carried some form of lightweight shelter with them at all times, because they clearly didn't need permanent structures all the time. But we do have rare examples of them. And I will give you a lesser known case study now, and that's Howick House. Howick House is on the Northumberland coast. However, during the Mesolithic period, the house would have been further away from the coastline owing to the lower sea levels at the time. This has been described as a pit house as it's got a sunken floor, it's roughly circular and it had a central hearth. There are also several stake holes as well which must have related to the structure. The house itself has three different phases meaning it's been remodeled three times and dating throughout the structure has thrown up this surprising evidence that the house probably had longevity and may have been used for up to 400 years. The people who lived in the house exploited the surrounding landscape and there were examples of marine shells, hazelnuts and acorns found around the pits and scoops of the house, but they were also able to exploit birds, foxes, possibly a dog or a wolf was found, as well as wild pig. The stone tools that the Mesolithic people employed help us to gain some insight into what they're exploiting in their environment. What is instantly noticeable in the Mesolithic stone tool collection is just how small some of the stone tools become in comparison to the Upper Paleolithic. These are called microliths, which you can see in the top right hand corner, and they're probably projectile points, maybe things like harpoons, maybe for arrows, we're not entirely sure, but it's likely that archery was employed at some point during the Mesolithic period as well. Of course, we find the standard scrapers and burins, which are processing tools for all sorts of things, both hides and plant materials, which they could use for clothing and structures, that kind of thing. And then we have things like the axe and the adze. An adze is like an axe, but think of an axe blade but sideways if that makes sense which suggests to us that they're woodworking which from star car and the howick house indeed they are and able to impact their environment and they're probably managing their environment as well to some extent so far no ceramics have been found from the mesolithic period in britain so they're known as an aceramic culture Pottery wouldn't appear in Britain until around 4000 BC with the beginning of the Neolithic period. What we can see though is that these are hunter gatherers and fishers who are able to exploit numerous environments. One such environment being the Severn Estuary in Gold Cliff where they were found to have exploited eels, otters and pig. Gold Cliff, they were probably only exploiting this during the summer months though, which I don't blame them. The Severn Estuary in winter must have been quite miserable. So they're moving around, employing different tools to gather resources at certain times of the year, not the same place all year round. At the beginning of the video, I pondered whether the Mesolithic period in Britain was a dark age in prehistory. Although going through all of this video, I think we can agree on that this isn't true at all. What is true is that the Mesolithic people did have a very light touch when it came to impacting the landscape, which therefore has implications on the archaeological record, i.e. we don't really find very much. Where we have found stuff, it's shown that the Mesolithic people are a highly adapted population and they're within all sorts of different environments, be that wetland or dry land. And they have highly specialized toolkits that are able to help them exploit prey within these landscapes. And they're also being able to manipulate these landscapes as well through clearance or building of structures 
although that is very rare. What has been a hangover which has impacted our research into the Mesolithic period is the poor treatment in the past of the skeletal record. I was chatting to an osteologist the other day who has an interest in this area and she was in agreement with me and she also highlighted that because they were found so long ago these sort of assemblages, skeletal assemblages, they end up in archives and are completely forgotten and they're only really beginning to be found now. So I think there has been a delay in what we know about the Mesolithic period purely because of old discoveries not going through the proper treatment processes, not going through the proper research. But hopefully going forward, this is going to change and we're going to learn much, much more about the Mesolithic population of Britain. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know this has been a whistle-stop tour of the Mesolithic period in Britain, but it is only meant to be an overview. But as always, I encourage you to go look through the sources which are listed in the description below. One thing I was particularly delighted about finding is a open access book online all about Star Car, and you can go and read that yourself. I think that's the link at the bottom. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time on Archaeology 101.